Good. Um, am I all clearly audible to everyone? Yeah. Yes. Yes. Thank you. Um, so a very good afternoon, everyone. And I'm honored to welcome you all to this uh, crucial session on psychosocial support for women during emergencies. As we all know, in, in the time of crisis, women often find themselves as an epicenter of impact, fixing unique challenges that demand very thoughtful and, let's say, targeted responses, um, whether it be natural disasters or conflicts or like war, public health crisis, any disasters it be, the psychosocial well-being of women is very important that we work on uh, for the overall sorry, overall resilience of the communities. So today, uh, through this session, we'll be uh, exploring the multifaceted aspects of providing effective psychosocial support for women, especially during the emergencies. And we'll also del delve into the specific needs and vulnerabilities women may experience uh, and the social dynamics at play and the importance of fostering a very supportive environment and that can promote healing and how can we do that. So without any further delay, I would like to introduce the trainer for today, uh, Mrs. Uh, Mrs. Sushmita Mukherjee. Uh, she is a director and gender and adolescent girls at PCI India. Ms. Mukherjee provides an overall direction and guidance for gender mainstreaming in the execution of different projects. She also leads the Umang project as project director at Jharkhand that strives to empower mothers as key agents to stop child marriage of young adolescent girls and boys. She helps PCI India build its body of work in the gender and empowerment domain and has created a space for her itself among its peers and donors. Before joining PCI, she worked at Care India as regional program director. Uh, we are so much privileged to have you, uh, ma'am, uh, as a trainer for this session. So we welcome you wholeheartedly. And uh, once again, thank you for all the participants for joining in us. So let's, without any delay, get into the training sessions. Uh, welcome, ma'am. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Hannah. And um, thanks to Fair India for inviting me to... Um, to, to share my experiences in the form of this tra training webinar to all the trainees here. Um, let me just start sharing my screen. Just a second. Is my screen visible? Yeah. Yes. Okay. So um, thanks, uh, Hannah, and uh, Happy New Year, and very good afternoon to all the participants uh, today. And I must say that um, psychosocial support uh, is very crucial, highly ignorant area. And um, it has its own reasons why people ignore it. And as we walk through today's um, session, will also understand the nuances of it and how crucial it is um, and that uh, how we have to deal or how we have to address the requirement of psychosocial support for women in the situation of crisis or emergencies. So as we move ahead, uh, things, I would request uh, for a quick Mentimeter exercise and I'll request if all of you uh, can either scan the QR code or, or on your mobile if that is available on the screen, or if you are on a laptop um, or computer, uh, if you can go to uh, menti.com and use the co code 78301464 uh, to do quick ex the two exercises there. Uh, do let me know if the if you are able to log in or their face challenge. Well, can you share the screen? Uh, 
You want the code? The code is 7830164. Uh, Ma'am, can you please write it in the chat? box or um the code uh, or if you can say it out i can write it in the chat yes yeah, please so the code is seven eight three zero yes one four six four all right Are you able to undertake the exercise? So the first question is, have you made any new year resolution for yourself? Mm -hmm. So there are 14 of us here. We have got two votes. Participants who may have joined uh, have not uh, gone through the full instructions. You may have to log on to menti.com and enter the code 78301464. Only six responses out of the 14, seven, okay. Eight. Let me also uh, launch to the next question. I'm not, I hope you are able to see the next question as well. Um, how was the year 2023 in terms of humanitarian situation? Uh, would you rank it as grave, very serious? Um, amber, it's okay, not so serious. Or it was uh, green, like it was a pleasant year. Mm -hmm. So in the first question out of the nine responses, we got that yes, at least five of uh, respondents are there who have made a new year resolution. Uh, if time is, would love to discuss. Oh, there are five no as well. Mm -hmm. So there are equal number of us here that who have a resolution and who do not have a resolution specifically for ourselves in the new year. And yes, so most of us like, you know, feel that 2023 was a little serious or very serious in terms of humanitarian situation globally. And um, there are some which fell now it was not so serious. That's interesting. I'm going to stop screen share and go for another one. Just bear with me. Um, And if you, if, if uh, may I request the participants to re-log into the Menti meter, but with a different code now, 
And um, Hannah, if you can again collect the code as I mentioned, say it uh, loudly. Yeah. Uh, sure. And put it on the chat. So the code is now 29369374. Yeah, um, it's already there in the chat box. So Michelle have added it. Oh, great. So now I request uh, two more questions to all the participants to react to. Uh, how was your last meal? Like some of us may have had their lunch, some of may have had their, some brunch or whatever you consider your last meal as. Could you please express it in terms of an emotion? Hannah or Michelle, you are also taking care of the chat. I'm, I won't be able to do the chat, uh, uh, you know, checking the chats as well. Yes, yes. So the question is that please express your emotions, but with your last meal. How, how do you see your last meal was all about? Are people able to log in? If there are issues, uh, please let, let know. Mm -hmm. And those who are done with the question, then there's the next question also, what are your expectations from the session? Uh, you can go for both the questions if you're done with the first one. The question is on your screen as well. What are your expectations from the session? Only eight people have responded to the last meal emotion question. And yes, only two have talked about what are their expectations from the session. Great. Uh, I'm a little conscious of time as well, so I'm just stopping the screen share, but uh, uh, the, the exercise are still open and it would be good if you could complete the exercise. Okay, so while uh, all the participants are completing the exercise, I'm sure like, you know, uh, those who have got some new year resolution are also thinking of how do they put it in their professional world. Yes, the year 2023 also showed us a varied uh, formats of uh, humanitarian situation that can occur. Uh, great, but did you find it difficult when I asked you to 
how to put emotion word for your last meal? Can anybody unmute and, and say how was your, what was your reaction when you were asked to put emotion to your meal? Am I audible? Uh, Michelle, am I audible? Yes, yes, yes you are audible. Um, so uh -huh. somebody in the chat wrote pleasant. Oh, okay. Uh huh. Great. And uh, for me, I uh, it I had to stop and think and. Yeah, like didn't know that that's not something that we think about. So had to think. Yeah. Also, there is another response in the chat. Um, Anil sir says, realized very slowly what to do. <laughs> yes, so because attaching emotions every time and expressing it every time is uh, something interesting. And hopefully we will. Um, talk and discuss about it and hopefully I'll be also there will be opportunities for all of us to also speak but let me uh, start with yes uh, as this is a more of a high level uh, recap session uh, for uh, you all and you have been like you know trained a lot on the humanitarian situations so I would like to start with that uh, yes the word crisis humanitarian situation disaster I think we keep on using this um, words alternately to talk about situations and primarily we want to express that this is a situation of vulnerability. This is a, a situation of vulnerability at a mass level, at a large scale level. And we all know that this can be due to any natural process or as a resultant of a human activity, which is a resultant immediate result or a long term result like a climate change. So the term crisis covers a variety of situations where functioning of a society is seriously disrupted, causing widespread human, material, or environmental losses, which, ex which exceed the ability or it makes the society completely disabled to cope up using its own resources. So hence, um, we are talking of humanitarian situation, but today I'll um, be more talking about that how it is about the life of the women uh, in it. So the crisis, as um, the in the introduction also Hannah mentioned, it always affects the women differently, and not only women like you know women as such in our societal structure, but crisis always disproportionately affect the weakest and the marginalized group. And we know that in our in our so, uh, social structural setup, women and the marginalized group are one of the constant, uh, like, you know, demographic uh, cohort that is, uh, that falls in that. So that's the second bullet mentioned here, that women tend to be more exposed to the adverse effects of crisis due to their pre-crisis patterns of dealing with poverty, their secondary status in the workforce market, over-representation in the informal economy, lesser access to productive assets and information, and extensive domestic responsibilities, which make it a multi-dimensional um, vulnerability, multi-layered vulnerability uh, for women. And hence, it calls for uh, special attention of uh, support to uh, women as such uh, in any humanitarian situations. And today we will be more talking of the psychosocial support uh, and there are other experts and I'm sure they have got other training for other aspects of the support as well. So we'll delve a little bit into the understanding of the uh, crisis and its impact on the lives of the women. Uh, there are multiple, and this is in no um, sequence of severity or in no sequence or in no alphabetic order. So, so these are like, you know, and I'm sure um, most of us who have been working in a humanitarian spaces uh, know the nuances of it and exactly have seen the people going through all these things, and especially women. First of all, I will start with the economic insecurity. There's a kind of vulnerability it, it leads to. There is a lot of economic aspects involved in it. There's a lot of productive and loss of productive assets, 
reduced access to goods and services, the future becomes totally bleak. The decreasing employment and income opportunities is a one big gamut that influences. It influences both women and women, uh, but women because of their, in the previous slide we're looking to, because of their gendered uh, conditioning are more impacted. And women are more likely to lose their jobs than men. Um, their work time is, uh, their time more get into, um, getting into unpaid care work. And, and we know practically, you know, women are more involved in the informal sectors or into the small businesses, which get hit easily and hard uh, than the other jobs. Um, this may also cause for women to also lose, you know, the space and the voice that they had previously in the uh, domestic spaces. The household entitlements may completely get declined. Even if the woman is continuing at the workspaces, the working conditions get deteriorated. People always say you have to keep on adjusting and the most of the adjustment comments and expectations fall on the women as such. There may be uh, symptomatic, uh, you know, tangible effects like decrease in the wage levels, decrease in the benefits, sudden uninformed cuts in their uh, receivings, lack of um, coverage from the uh, standard labor uh, legislations, increasing job insecurity. Uh, so total deterioration of working conditions is something that um, is far more uh, like, you know, bearing on the women. Uh, of course, as I just mentioned that women's workload increases, she may be like, you know, searching for a job or even doing some petty uh, uh, income oriented work. In addition, there is a lot of household work. A lot of work falls on women just to like, you know, they, they may fa face that, okay, we have to reduce our expenditure. So more work falls on the woman in the, um, at the household level. Um, Education opportunities decrease. Uh, parents or the families may decide to uh, cut the expenditure on payment of fee or any other uh, educational investments, and that's the reason that you know young girls are uh, more uh, you know tend to get uh, married early. Uh, women, due to their uh, lesser mobility, lesser access to safe and secure uh, like you know transport mechanisms. Um, lesser safe spaces also take more time to recover. Like, you know, when you have to get back, when the post COVID scenarios have informed us that how it was difficult for women to uh, get back to their, uh, at least even to the level of their previous uh, income levels. Although I'm sure, like, you know, all of us who are working in the humanitarian spaces. We don't say that we have to go back to our previous state. We always say we have to build up better so that we become more resilient, more be able to um, face any uh, future uh, crisis or future humanitarian situations, at least of a similar nature, because we have learned it. So the recovery is uh, not so great for women. Then demographic patterns and the household structure also changes in the crisis affected areas. Um, one can uh, understand that, for example, the war or the conflict uh, situations, men migrate out or men join the conflict um, situations. Then the number of women-headed household increases. Women give, them, give work as sole providers and the caregivers. The decrease in adult male population has also the other gender effects. For example, uh, women are unable due to a lot of patriarchal uh, values to deal on some uh, household situation or um, negotiate on asset management. So those becomes uh, problematic. Gender roles changes. Uh, stress and psychological trauma is um, in crisis and post-crisis period uh, fall on women and they go ignored because women has to continue to get into the care job rather than themselves uh, demanding for care. There is also a possibility that uh, men's inability to live up to the ideals of masculinity sometimes, uh, many times, do affect uh, because they are they do not have the capacity to cope up with this loss or their inability to do their um, role, which may turn into negative consequences in the domestic life. 
So all these uh, issues uh, have uh, a lot of bearing on the women. And the last, you know, when we are getting into recovery phase, there is a lot of tendency that we accept or we get into the pathway where we tend to reiterate the um, gender stereotypical roles or just that patriarchal power dynamic uh, oriented uh, setup of the society, which then further impedes the any of the uh, advancement that had happened. Um, and the women are back to like maybe minus one in the entire square, but they have to again restart. So I hope I wanted to give you a glance of that when we all know a crisis has happened, how it impacts the life of the women in that area. So um, as for today's uh, focus, I'm going to bring in to, to, to today's focus rather than the entire humanitarian support uh, thing is the psychosocial support. So let's break it down. So psycho, psycho is anything about your feelings, thought and emotions. Social is about the environment in which the child lives, in which uh, the family lives, and then the woman lives. It, it includes the family, friends, community, schools, etc. That's your that's your social. And the support, the way the individuals are helped to cope up with their problems, traumas, and to build resilience. I think this is very interesting that what is the support are we talking of? Um, so this is what is the psychosocial support and um, as per the law of definitions of the leading humanitarian organizations, so psychosocial support is uh, defined as a process of facilitating resilience within individuals, families and communities by respecting the independence, dignity and coping mechanisms of individuals and communities. Psychosocial support can be both preventive and curative. It is preventive when it decreases the risk of developing mental health problems. And it is curative when it helps individuals and communities to overcome or deal with the psychosocial problems that may have arisen from the shock and effect of crisis. These two aspects of psychosocial support contribute to the building of resilience in the face of new crisis or other challenges uh, like circumstances. So this is very important for us to understand as a trainer, as a psychosocial psycho support providers, as a humanitarian um, you know, workers, that what are we doing and what is it resulting into? Am I facilitating a process? Am I respecting the independence? Am I respecting the dignity? Am I enabling them with the coping mechanisms? Is it resulting into resiliency? Unless and until we are really able to like, you know, take all these points, literally psychosocial support is not achieved. We won't be able to achieve to really enabling the woman to build back better so that she is, she becomes the next champion to build her communities, to build ensure that no other woman falls into this same um, zone of challenge. When we talk of overall psychosocial support in general, like an NLP situation or, or a normal C, we generally look into the Maslow's hierarchy to needs, and then you may see people talking of like, you know, first you need the food, water, warmth, rest, which is your physiological need. And I'm sure many of you have must have seen this uh, triangle of physiological needs, and then the safety needs, belonging, love esteem and the self-actualization where you actually then achieve your full utilization. But you know, there is a twist when it is a situation of humanitarian. In the situation of humanitarian, people first need the, uh, the, you know, this psychological support. It is the psychosocial support, the caring that somebody is there, that they can do it. That, that becomes much more proportionately uh, bigger and wider in any of the graphical analysis that you do uh, than the basic needs of food, water, everything. Food, water becomes then like, you know, more of a survival, but psychosocial becomes more of your um, exist uh, thing for the next round of moving on. So this is more to say that, you know, psychosocial support has a great role in making sure that not only the individual survives, but also uh, survives and then thrives in the next 
life, which is much better, much more resilient. Okay, I've spoken a lot. I have a question for all of you. So we say that when it is a humanitarian situation, crisis situation, people get into grief. And if people can unmute themselves or put it in the chat, what do you mean by grief? What, what, how do you see grief as? What is your definition of grief? Is my question clear? Either you can unmute yourself. I'm not sure if you have unmute facilities because it was a webinar, but you can put it on yeah, your chat. Yes, we can. They can unmute. Oh, okay, great. Anyone? What is grief for you? How do you see grief? Or put it on chat. which makes you feel unlucky as um, Anirj is writing, sadness. Yes, Satya. Fear, okay. Painful, confused state. Being sad for losing something, overwhelming emotion due to loss. Anybody want to share any uh, any of their experience? Please feel free to unmute your mic and talk also. Prolonged sadness, loss of important things, intense pain during immediate period. Great. Uh, so uh, all are correct answers. There is nothing uh, wrong in it. Definitely grief is when there's a very strong confluence of emotions in terms of mental and physical pain that one experiences when there is a loss. And grief is very personal because you are perceiving it, how you are perceiving your loss, how you are putting a severity to your loss is very, very, very personal. So as a psychosocial support provider, we need to be very careful to uh, understand what is grief in terms of the uh, service uh, receiver. And how do you identify it? One is loss, but how do you identify that um, emotion when people come to you, when women come to you, you know, they have all these patriarchal things that women should not laugh, women should be lesser expressive, women should be having a lesser mobile uh, mobility, women should have lesser like exposure, they should not be talking to external people much, they should be more in the inside the family, they should be taking care in such a situation, you know, many times, we have seen women are completely emotionless. They, they cannot ex express their emotions or their entire body language is also very blank. Their faces are also blank. So as a psychosocial uh, support worker, we need to be like, you know, very uh, much uh, like careful. We need to be very much like, you know, keeping an alert and vigilant that how we really identify so that that becomes the starting point of our engagement with our uh, client or with the women. So the manifestation of this uh, grief can be uh, numerous. It can be feelings in the form of emotions. It can be mental, like, you know, you have to understand that there's something going on in the mind of the individual which is not very expressive as well. There can be something very physical, and there can be something behavioral as well, the way they, you know, um, someone works, uh, acts um, as well. So this is some bit of some, uh, some of the examples of the grief that you may um, face when a woman reaches out to you for any psychosocial support or you are reaching out or you are observing um, women who are um, 
who have faced uh, some sort of crisis or an emergency or a humanitarian situation, that this is how. But these are all English words and you can you can uh, always see that there's a blurred line in everything. One can be the cause or the trigger for the another as well. Um, but grief is something that we are trying to say that it is expressible, it is non-expressible as well. It is all about women's ability as well. There can be crying, shaking, fatigue, like loss of energy, sleepiness, or total lack of uh, sleep, inability to settle, restlessness. There can be lot many uh, symptoms and there can be lot many no symptom situations as well where you will find uh, people when you are working in a uh, crisis uh, situation. Okay, so now we will come to uh, any questions on till now that uh, this was the section where I was just trying to um, position out the requirement of women and the essentiality of psychosocial support to women in crisis situations. Any questions? Can I check the chat? Uh, no, there are no questions. Are there any chat, uh, questions? You can please write or raise hands or unmute yourself. I hope people are feeling free to do any of these things to, to engage in this exercise. Okay. Should we proceed? Uh, so we will talk about a little bit about the psychological uh, support strategies. So in the psychosocial support, you know why we will support? Why are why are we there as a psychosocial support provider? What's our role? People are busy with like you know their uh, food or their safety, their security looking into that, you know, where to go, what entitlements they have to fill in the forms all about. That's where there's a lot of busyness here. But then what are we doing there? What is our role there? And that's what I would like to talk about, that when in the humanitarian situation, psychosocial support providers have a big role. And our role becomes in making the individual really a human resource. Because the human resource is not only a physical being, it's it's actually a combination of physical, mental, social, uh, political, and economical. So I think our job of giving two in, uh, critical components of enabling them as a human being is, is going to be the crux here, which is their psychological being, their mental being, and their social being. So as a psychosocial support provider, we have to ensure that we are giving them immediate psychological relief, recover, and enabling them for reconstruct. As a psychosocial support provider, as I was positioning and trying to tell you, attempted to tell you that how women are um, more and uh, differently uh, vulnerable, they are differently affected, they have different kind of implications because of any of these situations. It is very essential as a support providers for us to understand their emotions. And that's where I was trying to also tell if, if anybody has any, any experience of, like, you know, I tell you, when we were trying to reach out to women in a flood hit areas, women were constantly busy in like, you know, cooking, feeding the young and all those things. And when we started, when I started communicating with one or two women, the first thing was that you're the first one who asked me that how are you? What are you doing? Somebody was speaking to them to ask about them. Nobody has like, you know, since asked about them, they are only giving them orders, please, please do this, please do that, please do this, do that. So it is very essential as a psychosocial support provider that how do we connect with them? How do we really understand their emotions and acknowledge that? Acknowledgement is very, very, very crucial. And that's once you have acknowledged, once there is connect, then the story and the journey can continue between the support provider and the women. 
The second is, is the big thing, which is about giving the assurance and giving them reassurance to believe that building better is possible in you and in herself. Even the counselor, as a counselor, sometimes, many of time I've seen that even the counselors also feel that we come from the same community and how can we say that, you know, something can be better out of it? It's completely uh, destroyed. So it is very essential that both counselor and the client or the women have an assurance and reassurance um, in this entire process. Of course, there's talk and listen, allow them to share. All the silence should not be discouraged because many a times we have found that women want their silence also to be recognized and acknowledged. So as a counselor, I'm sure you have got a lot of counseling um, trainings as well. It is very essential that how we are engaging and engaging is not only always talking or listening. There is, if, if there is any sound waves there, no. And then there, there is discuss, provide information because then we have to build them back much more better for the next day. So I'll come to some of the counseling techniques. I'm sure you are more uh, aware of and have got a deeper uh, training on there are individual uh, counseling, there are pair or couple counseling, there are family counseling and group counseling. And all these have uh, different formats of um, engaging uh, with the individual or a set of um, individuals as well. And the process always starts with like building a rapport where you just make those connect, you know, the connecting and the engaging is the uh, crucial here. Whereas counselor, we try to assess the status of the women. Like, you know, we have to constantly, uh, like, you know, keep on identifying that what is the status of it? What sort of severity of the uh, psycho uh, psychosocial, uh, you know, uh, impact that the woman is going through. Uh, we have to do our assessments, goal setting. I mean, it is very essential that I, as a, as a woman, maybe, you know, many a time the woman have come to a counseling center where they found that I don't want to ventilate. I don't want to ventilate. I want somebody to listen to me. I will come back with my other questions, you know, just the goal setting is still not done. And then maybe the goal setting is, I want this, I want that. What do you want? Because life has many. But if you go one by one, that will just enable the women also have a very clear pathway of um, getting into next stage of improvement rather than contained into the mesh of um, the disaster uh, impacts. Then it's actual intervention. Uh, we have to continue to evaluate our processes as well and the, and the termination. Like, you know, if you feel that uh, either the goal has met or the woman is uh, currently not more anymore interested or we need to restart the entire process. So there has to be a, a culmination or the termination as well. The next is we also um, go through a stress management strategies. Uh, I'm sure many of you have been doing a lot of counseling and the uh, on the ground uh, zero situations and have been doing all these things. Uh, stress management is another way, uh, like, you know, where we facilitate the, uh, like, you know, the client or the women to be really taking in the reality of the situation. Many times I've found that women with a medium, uh, you know, impact, like, you know, low, medium, high levels and a medium impact, it becomes or it takes a lot of time for women to really feel that yes, there has been a loss. Um, there is this this loss may be recovered, but it needs to be into a different trajectory or different pathway altogether, where they may have to start a like a, a new journey altogether, or they may have to take some harsh decisions. So I think the stress management, the first is to enabling the woman. Uh, to really understand the situation in reality. And I must say the first step itself takes a lot of time. Because unless and until I as a woman are really like, you know, ready to accept it, you cannot make me uh, go for my next journey. 
So for example, like, you know, when we were uh, uh, working in a flood situation in Uttar Pradesh and um, we were talking to women that, you know, they have lost their land and the flood was so much that due to the river changing its course, uh, the, the entire village had got submerged as well. It was difficult for them because, you know, the woman said, I have this Aadhaar card. But this Aadhaar card, this address is no more which I can really touch and feel and see. It's gone beneath the river and maybe like, you know, just washed away and everything. So it becomes very difficult for them to also realize that the loss is a different thing altogether. So, you know, it was, it, it, there are ways of how do you, and, and that woman who, whose uh, case I'm really trying to recall was also a female headed, like, you know, she was the head of her, her house. And it was very difficult for us to like, you know, we, we took like two, three rounds of conversation for her to understand it and then try to uh, reach out to the next level of, okay, what's the next work that I have to do? We have to give them the information. We have to tell her that what are the next ways to uh, build it better. Uh, because sometimes, you know, this case was more about uh, enabling her to get some uh, entitlements from the government and making sure that, you know, she gets all her compensations. And this is, again, another type of uh, stress to deal with the system to enable her. But the initial conversation with her is something which is always in my uh, experience a zone that uh, pushes me that how to engage with the women. Uh, and how to help them out uh, and how to manage, help them to manage their own uh, stresses as well. As I had mentioned in the beginning, like we do not have to only uh, relieve them of the immediate stress or tension. Uh, we, are, we have to enable them to not only recover, but also ensure that they are ready with their skills and competencies they have some coping mechanisms for dealing with any future uh, unpredictable situations as well. It is very essential for us to be resilient as an individual, as communities as well. Because we have found that women in collectives or women together create or form a strong peer support group to each other. So many a times uh, when we have uh, worked with uh, women to build their resiliencies, in addition to addi uh, individual resiliency strategies, collective resiliency strategies have played a lot. Especially for example, uh, there was another case, I would say that in the drought relief in uh, Rajasthan, you found that the men have completely like, you know, migrated out to cities uh, to um, get some jobs or um, men are like, you know, every day going to, uh, to the Manrega uh, work that the government had initiated at that time. So the women will come together at the local temple or at the Anganwadi center where they will give a lot of support to each other because no one has like, you know, eaten maybe like, you know, since morning, whatever small uh, or little they may have only have given to their children. There's hardly any water. So, so that the temple, the, the sitting and, and talking to each other, or maybe very silence also at times, gave them a lot of like, you know, uh, support to, where they felt that I'm not alone in it. And during our work in COVID also, we found that when we reached out to the members of the self-help groups, and we asked them that during COVID, uh, what did you miss? Did you, uh, so they said we did, we missed the meetings. We missed talking to each other. We missed like, you know, uh, the touch and feel of how are you and things. So I think during the lockdown, they missed that collective power, which really disabled a lot of their voices and spaces inside their domestic arenas as well. So collective uh, resiliency building is another um, thing that as a psychosocial support providers, uh, we should practice and do. So when I say resiliency building, again, um, uh, taking the definitions from leading um, humanitarian uh, relief organizations. 
So the process of helping individuals, families, groups, communities to increase their personal, interpersonal, social, economic, and political strength, and to develop influences towards improving their circumstances. And enhancing resiliency is crucial for empowering the survivors to develop adequate coping abilities to deal with the odds due to disaster, and also the strengthening capacity to deal with future problems and eventualities. Let's say how we are building the resiliency. For example, in India, we know that there are a lot of geographical regions which annually get flood. So annually, maybe the communities uh, do know that there would be of this kind of disruptions, this kind of crisis. But every year, I must say that there is some unique uh, unknown uh, you know, crisis as well. But how do you then from each year make sure that the individuals or the communities are resilient? What could be those um, psychological coping of skills that the community may have that can be clubbed up with some other humanitarian preparations to make the community resiliency? How we can, uh, uh, let's say, uh, enable women with more skills or maybe livelihood skills, which are like, you know, uh, movable so that they, if they shift because of the flood, their livelihoods can also shift with them. So how do you bring or make the women or the communities much more resiliency? That should be the approach uh, from very beginning as a psychosocial support provider. That how I'm enabling them, empowering them to react and respond to the situation on their own in any future situations. So in the reconstructing thing, um, as a, a support provider, we can look for their economic development, building their uh, social capital, ensuring their channels for information and communication, receipt and dissemination and feedback, and enhancing the community competence. So like how as a community we become more resilient, how as a community we have our own roles and responsibilities divided to become a stronger as a sum of all uh, rather than individuals. So reconstructing a, to a better uh, uh, future is very essential part of our uh, psychosocial effort. So your community competency um, you know, strategies can include educating and informing community residents, leaders, groups, and coalitions as well so that uh, Women effort as the leaders are also supported by the larger community as uh, as well. Um, I'll take a little pause here, uh, Michelle or Hannah. If uh, partner uh, participants have any questions uh, here before I get into now the next section, which is life of the counselor. Or if there is anybody can put in on chat. Is there any any expression, any emotion, any question? You can use your emotion icons as well to express yourself. I believe there are emotion icons, yes. Anybody wants to unmute themselves or speak out as well? Is English the right uh, language? Do you want a, a mix with Hindi? I'm not sure. We also have participants from North and South, uh, Northeast and also maybe English is okay. uh, but if anybody wants uh, any clarification, please feel free to. Uh... 
Yeah, and not only clarification. I think I'm more of reiterating and bringing it more to the top of your mind. Any sort of uh, experience sharing you want to do, please. This is the time before I get into the next phase of the slides. That you may have, like, you know, faced a woman. It was, um, how did you... Um, dealt with the client to do any psychosocial support or what kind of emergency situations has anybody faced? Anything you want to talk about? Anybody worked during the COVID? Anybody worked during floods, landslides? We don't, we didn't have any earthquakes recently, but there has been floods and landslides. There has been like, you know, civil conflicts. <laughs> okay, no problem. Let's go into the life of a counselor. I think I have been talking about like, you know, that as a psychosocial support provider, we also have to be very cautious and conscious that how we are dealing with when we are dealing with a woman, when when we are providing services to a woman as a service recipient, we need to be conscious, like you know what we what we just now spoke that how do you do societal patriarchal setup? She's already a uh, marginalized and vulnerable person, and how a particular crisis situation has hit her. So this, this assessment, assessing the situation and then getting into action is very crucial for that counselor because that's where either people can get connected with you for a complete journey or they can completely reject you from the very beginning. There's a lot of hesitation. You know, women do really check also that are you the right confidant person with whom they can disclose any of their thing. Because many a times, we may be insider and we may not be the insider to the community. And both has its own pros and cons. If I am from the insider from the community, women may feel that because you are an insider, because you already know the situation, you may not be still the right person because you may disclose the identity, you may disclose a story with the identity. So that's the negative. Now, because the other thing, if you are an outsider to the community, then the women may feel you won't understand because you have not faced the actual crisis situation. Then you won't understand what I'm talking of talking about you. If you are not of similar age or you are not similar like you know background characteristics, again we'll say because you do not know, uh, you do not belong to me, you do not belong to my community, so you are not the right fit to be talking. So you, again, uh, that is why connecting and engaging with the women is the most initially the the most uh, tricky, uh, trickiest part of it. And hence, active listening and observation is, is, is very, very, very crucial um, that how you are really like, you know, uh, listening uh, and observing the women. You remember when I said the assessment, asking the right question. Uh, have you eaten anything? can be a right question and can be a wrong question as well. So how do you uh, perform at that situation is very essential. Having the right communication skills, right body language, right gestures, right level of attention is very essential. Empathy, genuineness. You have to like, you know, you do not need to commit anything or you do not need to uh, over disclose about self. You do not need to under disclose about self. You have to be careful. An unconditional positive regard and an honest self disclosure as well. So, these are the very essentialities, particularly when you are talking to women, because women is putting a lot of confidence. She is she is putting a confidence that you will not talk about me to my husband. My husband may be also coming to you uh, for any um, discussion, counseling. She may have her own uh, things which uh, she would like to be remain confidential with you. So that's why it is very essential for counselor to be um, active listener, asking the right questions, having the right empathy, right communication uh, skills. I would now also talk about some bit of ethics in counseling, which is uh, related to what I was telling you uh, in my previous slide, that as a uh, psychosocial support service provider, there are certain ethics things 
uh, we need to be uh, ensuring like without any failure, no compromise, no nothing, no failure is uh, accepted. Number one, do not reiterate gendered roles and responsibilities and stereotypes. You should never say that, you know, because it is unsafe, uh, because you are a woman, uh, that is why you do it. You have to have to facilitate their empowerment process. So that's where they will be uh, building back better. Uh, so, so that's a big, big, uh, like no area uh, you have to be careful. Cultural sensitivity. Um, how people react, respond, weird, uh, talk, celebrate, or don't celebrate him. Do no harm. Your process should be empowering. Your, your process should not be making them lose their voice and space in different, uh, uh, like, you know, levels of their life. Confidentiality, privacy, avoid stigmatizing or discriminatory uh, behaviors. They may not be very neat and clean. They may not have been very many times hygienic, uh, in a hygienic conditions as well. So we need to have a positive regard. Allow women to choose her actions and decide. I think this is very crucial that we should not be putting the decisions uh, for them. They have to uh, be given all the information to be able to weigh the pros and cons for the choosing the next pathway of their life. Fidelity, making realistic uh, commitments key and keeping promises, veracity, that is truthfulness and the honesty in your um, services. And uh, as a psychosocial support providers, once we have done our assessments while we are engaging our clients, in case you find that these are high-risk um, individuals, we should make immediate uh, referrals or connect with our supervisor um, to uh, to deal with such cases that how do we ensure that those who need higher degree of uh, uh, medical services or, or any other support, they do uh, are able to access that or you are, they are getting referred to that uh, right level of services. Um, this is the issue of counselors as well. And I, I find very rarely it is uh, spoken about, like us as a counselors, us as psychosocial service providers also have our own concerns and we need to be careful of, we face a lot of burnouts, fatigue. A lot of us also have an impact on personal life, impact on family members and other relations. It is very essential for the counselors themselves to also have a very healthy uh, mental health uh, to be a very um, to be a very positive uh, counselor. If we are like you know receiving too many cases, and we know that this is an emergency situation, this is a crisis situation, so of course people will come with like you know a lot of grief, a lot of anxiety, a lot of stressful uh, situations, a lot of like you know survivors with different uh, level of uh, impact. And throughout the day, when we keep on um, listening to such scenarios or listening to such, uh, um, you know, narrations, uh, sometimes we are actually closer also to, to such a um, physical uh, re region as well. It becomes there is a lot of burnout and the fatigue that uh, counselors happen. So as uh, those of those of you who are supervisors, those of you who are planning, uh, you know, such interventions should take care of the mental health of the service providers as well. There are cases, there have been uh, situations where, uh, like, you know, the mental health service providers have got their family life disrupted, their relations disrupted, their own uh, mental health has also got uh, impacted. So I think this is very crucial, uh, those of us who are working in the mental health spaces and they are working in the role of uh, planning or supervisors or somebody who has a team to really ensure a, a, a balance of um, workload. And here it is their engagement with the crisis situation, their engagement with the uh, clients who are uh, in the crisis um, situation. So that's where I would like to uh, end my uh, you know, discussions today uh, to again reiterate that women have different needs in the entire humanitarian situation and in the entire humanitarian situation, psychosocial support is very, very, very crucial. And if we are able to make somebody 
mentally uh, prepared for building back better. We are able to prepare somebody that an alternate successful life is possible. Whatever is the uh, you know current impact, there's always a possibility to, you can see that the people have come out of it very successfully and positively. Uh, thank you. Uh, if there are any questions or reflections, um, happy to uh, discuss it already. Thank you. Over to Hannah Vishal. Thank you so much, ma'am. Uh, it was a wonderful session. Um, so I just, uh, as you also told, let me open it for any question or discussion with anyone. Uh, you can also put it in the chat box if you don't feel comfortable speaking. So. Yeah, thanks, uh, Super Lakshmi. Uh, but I would love if if any of you just uh, unmute yourself and discuss maybe uh, how you have responded to some situations. What has been your experience? You all are like you know uh, much more uh, experienced in dealing uh, with uh, psychosocial support. Uh, good evening, ma'am. This is Super Lakshmi from Chennai. Uh, we have worked in uh, this uh, Chennai flood, the recent floods also, and uh, before that, uh, 2015 floods also, after post-recovery with uh, UNICEF. Uh, so we mostly work with the uh, children and uh, women. Uh, so the main la thing lacking is the preparedness with uh, all the women. Because after the any disaster, everything uh, arrives, uh, instead of going and uh, giving them counseling, everything. So the previously, whether the disaster occurs or not, uh, the preparedness should be given. That is my uh, thing. Sure, sure, definitely. We all, we all, like, you know, uh, because life is so unpredictable, anything can happen. We all should be like, you know, getting these kind of uh, lessons of how to remain prepared. Uh, and have the skills to cope up with crisis, definitely, all of us, whether, and especially Chennai now, uh, like, you know, having always the risk of getting floods um, needs more attention. Yes, ma'am, yes, ma'am. May I request any other um, persons to share their on-ground uh, experiences? Uh, do let us know if you are facing issues because of your uh, language of expression, language of talking. I'm sure you can manage somehow to get it translated. Put it in the chat box if you're facing any technical glitch of unmuting yourself. Okay, just one more thing, um, you know, I noted when I had very initially asked that, uh, what is your expectation from the session? This was my fourth question uh, on the mentee. And one of the things that had was written there, which I have not um, captured uh, during my session is the evaluation techniques. Um, so that's a very subject close to my heart. Um, but, you know, um, I must say here is that, Evaluation techniques for a normal or a peace situation project interventions and um, an evaluation of an humanitarian situation interventions are very different. And particularly if you want to really measure that, you know, it depends on what are you trying to measure. For example, if you want to measure like, you know, if my psychosocial support engagement has enabled the woman to uh, be resilient, you know, that's a very high level of impact we want to measure. Let's say very short things. If if I am getting regular clients, if I am getting being able to engage, and um, if I am getting client, um, like you know, because there will be multiple seating. So if I am getting my client to complete all the required sittings, if I am getting my client to take a decision on her own uh, happily and closing a case. So there are multiple ways where we can assess the 
progress of our sessions. So I would say these are assessing our progress of our sessions that how we are going with the individual uh, sessions. But if you want to really evaluate an intervention, let's say if you want to evaluate that if as a, uh, if as a counselor, I am being positioned uh, near to the humanitarian situation, for example, what happens is that uh, what happens during floods, uh, we, tr we try to um, refuse the community uh, near to a highland or something. And if there's a counselor being posted there, so you can do an evaluation whether posting a counselor near to the community works or you're posting a counselor at a health post where the women have to walk like, you know, two to three kilometers, does that work? There are multiple things what you want to assess. And um, there are also ways uh, how we can assess if you want to get into very uh, Statistical uh, quantitative studies are also possible. There are qualitative studies are also possible. Mix, mixed methods are also possible. Or a process documentation which talks about the journeys of the people also is possible. So measurement is definitely possible. But I must say that because in measurement, many times the baseline is not there. Baseline is, is your peak situation, uh, which you may not have captured any always. Unless until you know that a sampler are recurring and you may see, okay, what happened in the last year, have the, have the community become resilient, have the really like, you know, being ready, uh, prepared, ki, what will they do when the next floods come? Do they have like, you know, uh, prepared their own refuge strategies or not? Um, so, uh, so that's where one can measure and I'm happy to talk about maybe in some other session more about uh, the measurement aspects of and which can be applied in humanitarian situation. Good evening, madam. I am T.S.C. Rao from Andhra Pradesh. Yeah, like different disasters need specific psychological support, especially for women. For example, loss of land in flats. They are very concerned about that. In, uh, in another case, like uh, during earthquakes, they are more particular about their shelter life. In such situations, shall we have specific uh, processes, specific uh, uh, strategies to tackle that? So I must say that the disaster and what the consequences of disaster has like you know, has an impact on the women that is the thing because i i as a psychosocial support provider or you as a psychosocial support provider are providing psychosocial support to the woman as per the uh, impact of that you know the woman has got so the woman has to first like you know identify or you have to also enable her what is the status like you know so loss of land maybe uh, have a different impact on the woman and again with all respect i think there is if there's a loss of life there's a different impact and then the whose life has got lost what sort of land has get, got lost that also has an impact so we mean we first need to identify that what is the level of the uh, psychological conditioning the client is with me and accordingly you have to treat them and then she will be able to identify like, you know, with the engagement that, uh, you know, sometimes, for example, a loss of a barren land, but it was a land, it was only my agricultural field. It's a different thing when they lose their own residential field or loss of a uh, loss of husband or a loss of child if, or, or loss of like, you know, very old sick parents. Everything has a different uh, psychological impact on the individual. So accordingly, your treatment would be. It's not about the flood-based loss or earthquake-based loss. It is the impact on the uh, woman that will, uh, uh, you know, that will identify your uh, way of treatment or way of, way of uh, positioning your counseling strategies. Was that helpful? Uh, yeah, thank you, ma'am. Yeah. Like as a doctor, you know, you have to see that what is the patient suffering about. <clears throat>
but resiliency is very very important and i would really for, uh, like you know request and call for action that any of the attempts for psychosocial support any sort of intervention design should have an essential component of resiliency and coping up mechanisms to build them build, build back better is the like you know non negotiable in any of the attempts it should be it should not be only relieving them with the immediate stress or relieving them with the immediate anxiety or grief or something like that uh, the story should not end there. Ma'am, I am giving one more example like that. I worked in uh, Nepal earthquakes during initial time. I basically, I am a war specialist. When I visited the villages, Mainly the <clears throat> Nepalese, they fetch water in, from the hills, mainly through springs, protector and unprotected springs. Due to earthquake, the water, uh, groundwater flow direction has changed. Before that, uh, what happened? In, if there is a source, specific habitation people used to fetch the water. After the earthquake, that spring source has disappeared and it has diverted to some other nearby habitation. Then there was a conflict between mainly uh, among women. Because before you have not uh, allowed us to fetch the water from your source. Now how can we? Be? That type of situation is also there. Just I am sharing my experiences. No, very true, very true. And uh, of course, uh, this, this has happened in, in Nepal earthquake. And um, yeah, I have not really dealt with the community uh, things and more looked into the women as a client. But um, I, I'm not sure how, how you or, or your intervention dealt with, but I really feel that the, the collective uh, agency building or the collective um, interventions that I was referring to when, when we we're talking of community competency building, could be one of the um, like components of uh, mitigating the issue between the two communities. But how did you do it? Why don't you share the entire thing? No, that time uh, I was uh, in a least uh, span of time. I worked with the government. I gave my, some of my recommendations to them. And then I don't know what happened. No, no, no. They are also building some of the pipelines and the and the water supplies thing. But yes, like it, it, it. Today it is it is some resource. Tomorrow it can be any other resource, um, which is true. Like you know, uh, how do we also resolve the community based uh, uh, issues? Uh, because this is this is a very, very difficult, a different um, yeah. kind of impact. Yeah. 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 And I think this this should be part of the resiliency building as well that. How human beings uh, support each other, cope up with each other, live together in, as a as a holistic community. Thank you. Great, uh, Michelle and Hannah. Definitely, uh, many many thanks uh, to, uh, like you know for giving me this platform to talk and share, and um, definitely calling for a uh, more conscious uh, uh, agenda for giving special attention to women's requirement of psychosocial support across humanitarian situations, including civil rights, including like you know for example in the Manipur riots, we saw how women were the target of the entire victimization. So we can see that women have women women need a special space in the humanitarian programming and the psychosocial support and we as the development sector and humanitarian workers definitely need to like you know have our special efforts to uh, mitigate these things and um, i look forward <laughs> sphere to particularly you know talk about much more allowed uh, that is the entire thing how we can look into the aspects of not only the adult women but also with children who are the most vulnerable in in all these circumstances girls and as um, 
uh, was mentioning wash is another big thing uh, for women to be counseled of uh, in addition to the basic requirements of food, shelter, and water. So thanks a lot. I think uh, this uh, this uh, humanitarian sector will constantly need a lot of evolution of us as well because every time the crisis is getting much and much more complex um, than we then like you know some thirty years back the when we when I at least I started into the, into this sector and within this complexity is how we can make the life of the women much more empowering in this um, experience is our. Uh, like you know, is the is the test we have to go through every day. So thank you, Hannah. Thank you, Mission. Uh, thank you so much, ma'am. Uh, it was definitely a wonderful session. You delved a lot deeper into uh, talking about vulnerab vulnerabilities and also on different strategies, how on a very practical level, like how we can go on fields and um, like if in case we are provide, like providing psychosocial support. Thank you so much for your expertise and aware. thank you so much for your time and accepting an invitation for this. We're very grateful. Also, we have recorded the session. So a couple of people who couldn't join, uh, we'll be able to uh, send it to them later through YouTube platform. Anyway, once again, thank you so much. And also for the participants for uh, joining the session. And as you all know, this is a series that we are doing and um, two sessions have already been completed. We have our upcoming session, which is dealing psychosocial support for people with disabilities in emergencies. Uh, we are having a speaker uh, from Humanity and Inclusion, Bangladesh, uh, who is an expert in the field who is taking classes. Uh, I request everybody to note the date, which is 24th of January, the coming Wednesday, the same timing. Uh, I'll be sending the details in the WhatsApp group too. So kindly register. And uh, thank you so much, everyone. And thank you so much again, uh, expressing my big thank you to the speaker and also to all the participants. Thank you, thank everyone. You. Have a nice day.